Welcome to our weekly Church on the Rock Wasilla podcast. For more information, visit us at churchontherockak.org or like us at COTR Wasilla on our Facebook page. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy our weekly podcast. Worship is adoring God. And really, for, to me, worship is just having a conversation with Him and just talking to Him, really, and hearing what He has to say about me and just who I am. So that is what worship is. What is worship? Worship is giving back to God what is due. today one of our very own missionaries, the right Reverend Johnny Ramirez. Would you welcome him to the stage? Johnny is no stranger to Church on the Rock, and I just have to tell you with all sincerity, I love this guy. Uh, Johnny and I have known each other for quite a few years. Um, your son, AJ, who was just up here leading worship with us, was in my youth group back in the day, which means we're both old. Um, so... Uh, but one of the things I love about Johnny is his passion for worship, and the other thing is his passion for learning, and, and I hope when I'm 70 like you are that I still have, just kidding, I still have that same passion for learning and hearing from God, and so I'm going to pray over the preaching of the word, and we're going to jump right in. Father, thank you so much for Johnny. God, I thank you for the passion that you have put in him. I thank you for his desire to see your name made great every place that he goes. And so, Father, we just commit ourselves in these next few moments as the church to hearing from you. Would you speak to us and would we be transformed through the preaching of the word? In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you. Hey, everybody. How's everybody doing? I am always excited to get a chance to, to share the Word of God with you, especially here at our home church. And uh, so I wanted to just give you guys an update on where we've been and what we've been doing. Uh, Family-wise, just, we just dropped off my daughter at college. And guys, I have to tell you, it was excruciating. You know, for me, I, I told my daughter, we were there for a week, everything was fine, but on the last day when we have to fly back home, oh my Lord, I'm telling you. I was bawling like a little baby. And I told her, Daddy wasn't ready for this, baby. Daddy was not ready for this. I mean, I knew, and I told her, I knew eventually I'd have to give you away, but I thought, you know, to some guy, and then you would do the, the Mexican thing and just move in with us, and, and I would bother you for the rest of your life. So I didn't really have any pressure there. No, 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 no. And I go, but, and I looked at her, and I go, I mean, I've been taking care of you, providing for you, protecting you. Uh, guiding you forever. And now I'm just supposed to leave you here without me. Have you ever felt like you're shirking some sort of responsibility or something? Man, so those of you who have gone through it, man, love you. Love you, man. I'm with you. I know what you feel. And so please be praying for Jubilee. She's doing great. She's at Northwest University. And uh, the Lord is just really opening up doors for her. She is studying to be a psychologist. She says that she wants to tell me why I am the way I am. So many people have tried. So I'm praying for her on that. Uh, and for those of you, uh, as, as you know, my son, AJ, uh, he told us, let us know, and we're excited and afraid at the same time, but I guess at the end of this month, he and his beautiful wife, Emily, are going to make my wife and I grandparents. So, the clan de Ramirez is growing, hallelujah, amen? So, uh, I thought I might speak in Spanish, just because I don't want Wampa to miss anything, but... Uh, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and speak in English. Oh, but uh, uh, I'm so excited at to what the Lord is doing in ministry. We've been going wherever the Lord has opened doors, and uh, we've gone and and to see God touch people is one thing. But when you 
when you meet pastors that have been pastoring and in ministry for years and years and years, and you see them after the teaching of the word, after the worship, just be broken and, and say things how they had somehow lost the simple faith of believing in Jesus. And, it, you know, without realizing it, many of us become religious. We even get religious about not being religious, I'm telling you. So to see that happen to me has been such an incredible thing. So guys, please keep praying for us. Uh, we move straight by faith. If the Lord provides the finances to go, we go. If the finances don't come in, we can't go. So I want you, how many of you receive our newsletter? Anybody receive our newsletter? If, if you don't receive our newsletter, I'd love to have that. If you can sign up, we have a table right outside. Just sign up, give us your email. We'll start sending you that newsletter so you know where we're at and know what to pray about, okay? All right. So we're going to continue today. We're speaking on the topic of worship. And Pastor Jeremy, when he first started out, he let us know that worship isn't just about singing and music. Amen? It's not just about that. In fact, the Bible doesn't really give you a formal definition of worship, but perhaps we can start by seeing what some of the words for worship mean. And we're going to start with the English word worship, which comes from two old English words, which is wayearth, wayearth, which means worth, and sipe or ship, which stands for the shape or the quality of something. That's where we get words like friendship and, and uh, sportsmanship. Friendship is the, the quality of being a friend. A sportsmanship is the quality of being a good sport. That's where we get that. So really, worthship is the quality of having worth or of being worthy, all right? So when we worship, we are saying that God has worth, that he is worthy. Worship means to declare worth, to attribute worth, or to put it in biblical terms, to praise God. Okay? We speak or sing about how good and powerful God is. This is the purpose for which we are called. Okay? So I really want you to listen as we look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Amen? So we're called for the purpose of praising God, worshiping God. That is one of the job descriptions of a Christian. We should declare that God is worthy, worth more than everything else put together. Pastor Dalton let us know that in both Hebrew and Greek, there are two major kinds of words for worship. The first kind described an actual physical position of our bodies. So have you ever go to a church where people throw themselves on the floor or where they lift their hands or, or where they bow down? All of that is an expression of worship. It's your body expressing worship, okay? So don't freak out if you see that, all right? It's just people. If, if you go to a Mexican church, don't freak out. We're Mexican, okay? It's what we do. Somos Latinos, we have a lot of that passion. So, I mean, think about it. You notice that I use my hand a lot? If you look at Italians and Hispanics, we talk like that all the time. It's not that we're angry, okay? The greatest thing to do is you'll know that there's an Italian or a, or a Mexican in a car. If he's driving in the car and you see his hand doing this, he's on the phone. He may not be angry. He may be just saying, you know, I just love this life. But you know what I'm saying? So don't freak out. It's just expressions, okay? We are different cultures. We express differently, all right? So Pastor Dalton gave us that information. Let us know that there's those two, the kind that describe a physical action. And then there's the other one. And, and that physical action is basically you saying, I will do whatever you want me to. I'm ready to listen to your instructions, and I'm willing to obey. That's what those physical things should show. The other kind of biblical word means to serve. It carries the idea of doing something for God, making a sacrifice or carrying out his instructions. Of course, word meanings don't prove what worship is. But they do illustrate three kinds of worship. There is number one, worship that involves speaking. Number two, worship that involves listening. Number three, worship that involves doing. Okay, there is a worship that expresses the heart and a worship that involves the mind and a worship that involves the body. 
There is a worship that is giving praise upward, a worship that is receiving instructions from above, and a worship that carries out instructions in the world around us. Here's the thing, guys. We need all of these of worship. We need all three types in our lives. Amen? Some people focus primarily on speaking or singing praise to God. When you ask the question, what is worship? That's immediately what they think. Singing, praising, saying hallelujah. Now, praise is good, but if all we do is praise God without ever listening to what he says, we have to ask whether or not we believe what we're singing. Amen? We have to ask if we actually believe what we're singing. Oh, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Right? We sing that stuff. But do we really believe what we're singing? Do we act like we believe it? Amen? So some people focus on that. But then if he is really all wise and all loving, then we need to be attentive to what he's telling us because he's worth listening to. Amen? Truthfully, all talk and no action does not show God the respect that he deserves. Actions speak louder than words. How many have heard that phrase? Actions speak louder than words, and if our behavior isn't changed by God, then our actions are saying that God isn't important. He's a nice idea, but not relevant to our day-to-day -day lives, to the things that I do daily. He doesn't really have anything to do with that. I just go and, you know, check him out for a little bit on Sundays, right? When we really believe that God is worthy of every praise, then we will be willing to listen and to change the way we live in response to this worthy God. We will trust him and seek him and want to please him with as much as we can. Now here, here's the truth. Worship should affect our behavior. Did you guys get that? Worship should affect our behavior. Praise can affect you for the moment, but worship will affect you for a lifetime because it affects your behavior, the way that you speak. Now, there was a time in this nation when people thought about church, it was an actual location. It was a building in their city or neighborhood where people would gather together on Sunday mornings to pray and sing and learn the word of God, not to mention be part and do community together. See, to, due to all the technological advances, church is really a more fluid thing today. Those who are not able to physically attend can have church right at home merely by turning on their television or by opening up their laptop and watching it online. But sadly, many have taken and have chosen to take this as a license to no longer gather with others in a building somewhere. Okay, so it's a kind of a blessing and a curse. While we are grateful for those who serve and maybe out deployed some, some other country that they can actually join us, and some of them are right now online, we're thankful for that. Maybe some that are, that are sick or in the hospital or unable to get here, they can join us online. We're thankful for that. But there are those, sadly, that choose not to attend Yet the scripture tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, it says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Amen? So the scripture is telling us that we should not neglect getting together like we are right now. See, there's an element of worship and Christianity that cannot be experienced in private worship or by watching worship. There are some graces and blessings that God gives only when we're meeting together with other believers. Let me show you that. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. How many believe that? Amen. You know, I, I was at a small church in Roma, Texas. And I read that scripture and I asked them that question, how many believe that? And you know, there's those, again, expressions. There's those kind of churches. When I said, how many believe they all shouted, amen. And then I asked the question, another question. I said, 
Well, if you could see Jesus appear before your eyes physically, that you would be able to see him standing right there, what would you do? There are churches, guys, just letting you know that will answer you. They're not, they're not like some churches where you'll, they'll just, hmm, hmm. No, they'll, they'll actually say something. So I asked that question, and this lady shouts out, well, I think I just dropped right down dead. And I smiled and I said, what else? Another gentleman that I remember, he says, well, I'd probably run through the streets like a crazy man telling people Jesus is here. And so I said, but, but listen to me, guys. I said, we just read where two or three are gathered together in my name. I am in the midst of them. And when I asked you if you believe, you all shouted amen. And they said again, amen. And I go, well, then, sister, why ain't you dead? <laughs> and brother, you're still here. Shouldn't you be running like through the streets like a fool? Do you see what I'm saying? There's a lot of stuff that we say, but our actions don't say it with us. We say we believe and we love God, and yet we go through a trial or through some sort of problem, and we immediately panic as if God is nowhere to be found. See, worshiping Jesus together may be the single most important thing we do. It plays an indispensable role in the rekindling our spiritual fire and keeps it burning. See, corporate worship brings together God's word, prayer, and fellowship. And so that makes a great combination for God's ongoing grace to be visible in our faces all throughout our Christian life. Amen? Amen. Now, according to Matthew, we know that God himself joins us when we come together. And Hebrews 10 gives us a few reasons why we should not stop coming together. This scripture points out that there are things that we experience in our daily lives that can disorient us, that can kind of throw us off. We get those disorienting feelings all the time. For example, you're at work. There's a, a position opening up. It's an upgrade in pay. It's, it's everything that you need. And you've been doing everything you're supposed to do. You're faithful. You do everything you're supposed to do. And still, some other person gets the, the big break. Have you ever been there? No? Just me? Okay. Yeah, I mean, think about it. We, we get those kind of feelings all the time. Like, I have this story. My brothers and I, you know, we grew up, we were very poor. We were dirtbag poor is the way I like to say it. And uh, so w the Lord taught us how to play. We began to play when we were little kids. But our equipment, what we had was what we could afford, which was dirtbag equipment. Okay? Then we meet these, these other kids that their daddy made a whole lot more money than my daddy. And these kids were musicians as well. And I'm being very generous to say they were musicians. They stunk. They were horrible. I mean, bad horrible. Like, Lord God, help us, horrible. Okay? And yet, they had a bus. They had brand new equipment. I mean, mixers, speakers. Their guitars were amazing. Their amplifiers. And my brothers and I are like, why, God? God? I mean, we're faithful and we know how to play. And you give them everything. Have you ever had that, those kind of feelings? Okay, then it's just me. Pray for me, people. And, <laughs> and I know, you know, I, I've still got issues. Some of us are like Time Magazine, a lot of issues. Anyway, do you guys know what I'm talking about? See, we aren't the only ones that feel that way. We aren't the only ones that experience those kind of feelings. King David had some experience with those feelings as well. Look at Psalm 73, verse 2. It says, but as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping, and I was almost gone. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such a painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. Anybody here? Yeah, they don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. See, David was struggling. The spiritual fog that he was in was thick. But look, look how the breakthrough for him came. Verse 16 says, so I tried to understand why the wicked prosper. But what a difficult task that is. Then I went into your sanctuary, O God. 
And I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Amen? Did you catch that? Then I went into your temple. See, it was when he went into the temple, when he went to church, that the change occurred, that the fog lifted. See, when we worship together at church, our minds and our spirits get back in line. That fog disappears, and we begin to finally express true praise. Look at verse 25. It says, whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail. My spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. Amen? Amen. And many of us need to have that breakthrough today. We need to come back in line and realize that what's important is that the Lord God Almighty lives with you. See, I don't know about you, but I've experienced this, this first, first, firsthand. Suddenly my praise isn't due to my circumstances changing. It's not because I was in terrible need and now all of a sudden it came through. Oh, yes, thank you, Jesus. Anybody can do that. It's when you don't have anything, when the circumstances are hard, when you feel hurting and you feel pain and you feel loss and failure that it's hard to praise God. See, that change when we begin to praise him because we know that he's worthy to be praised. See, instead of staying away from corporate worship when we sense ourselves becoming spiritually lethargic, anybody here know what I'm talking about? You feel like you're just going through the motions? It's been so long since you felt God touch your heart in such a way that it messed you up. I don't know about you guys. It may not be common for you, but I love it when God messes me up. I, I want him to mess me up, even if he has to hit me to do it. Mess me up. Because when it's all said and done, when we're breathing our last, none of this matters. Whether we had money or didn't, whether we were really, really well organized or we're just completely crazy like I am, won't matter. What matters is that last breath that you breathe out that the God of heaven is standing next to you and says, come home. That's what will matter. You see what I'm saying? Look at verse 28. David understood it. He says, but as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. See, when we come together to worship God, his presence restores our focus, and the outcome is genuine, heartfelt evangelism. Can you imagine that? The outcome of our worship is evangelism. Suddenly it's easy to testify. Anybody ever had trouble testifying? Witnessing? It feels so awkward. I I'm wondering if I should go up and tell her about Jesus. And then you feel dumb when you say, excuse me, do you know Jesus? You know what I mean? If you say that in Mexico, everybody knows who Jesus is. They have one or two in their family. They'll say, Jesus, yeah, which one? Okay, so it feels weird. It does feel weird, but all of a sudden it becomes simple. It's like when you go watch a great movie and you tell, dude, you've got to watch this movie. Didn't feel awkward. It didn't, you'll tell anybody. You'll be on a bus somewhere and someone will be talking. Have you seen that Ben-Hur yet? And the guy next to him will say, I saw it. It was amazing. Why is that so easy? Because it affected our soul. Amen? See, we can't know God's worth, much less declare it, unless God reveals himself to us. So God initiates worship by revealing himself to us. Then we respond, and the proper response is worship. The more we grasp his greatness, his power, his love, his character, the more we understand his worthiness, the better we can declare his worth the better you and I can worship. See, our worship is a response to what God has revealed himself to be, not only who he is, but also in what he has done and is doing and will do in the future. See, worship includes all our responses to God, everything. 
including a response with, with our mind, such as our belief in God's worthiness, our emotions, such as love and trust, and our actions and our words. Our heart expresses itself in words and songs. Our mind is active when we want to learn what God wants us to do. And our bodies and strength are involved when we obey and when we serve. See, both Old Testament and New Testament tell us that a relationship with God should involve our heart, mind, soul, and strength. It involves all that we are. Worship involves the heart, the mind, the soul, and strength. The fact that we believe God says something about his worthiness. See, I know people believe in God. How many believe in God? See, the thing is, many people believe in God, but few believe God. See, we believe in God, but do you believe that he wants to heal your body? We believe in God, but do you believe that he wants to provide? We believe in God, but do you believe that he wants to direct you. Do you see what I'm saying? It's as if we believe in God, we just don't believe what God says. I don't know, but I think one cancels out the other. Right? See, when we begin to do this, when we begin to, with every expression, begin to worship God, see, the fact that we obey him also says that he is worth. Our words complete the picture by vocally declaring that God has worth. In, in the words that we say to one another, in the prayers that we say to God, in the songs we sing, we can declare that God is worth more than all other gods, worth more than all other things. We can worship God all by ourselves, but it is also something we should do together. God has revealed himself to not just to me, but to many. See, God puts us in a community. He, re he reveals himself to a community and through a community. The community get together responds to him in worship in declaring that he is worth all honor and all praise. We gather in his presence and because of his promise where he told us, that he would, where two or three are gathered together, I am in the midst of them. Because of that promise, we should expect him to be here. How many actually came this, this day to church expecting God to be here? See, that's the way we should. I mean, think about it. The mall announces Santa is going to be there. The kids want to go, and they show up because they expect Santa to be there, right? Right? Well, our God is way better than Santa. Because God is here all year round. Santa waits forever. And then you have to wait in the stinking line and somebody freaks out. Right? So God is here. And if you come, you should expect that he's here. Amen? He is the one that calls us together, who reveals himself to us, who initiates the worship, and is the object of our worship. See, one important method we use to worship God is that of music. In church, we have someone called a worship leader who leads us in singing hymns and spiritual songs. So a worship leader is a song leader. And because of that, some people automatically think of music when they hear the word worship, right? Now, music is important. Trust me. Music is important. I love music, okay? So music is important, but worship is not just music. You heard that before. See, it involves our entire relationship with God, all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength. It involves all the ways in which we can respond to God, all the ways we can praise him by what we say and do, all the ways we can demonstrate that God is worthy of all praise and all honor and all allegiance. So having said that, I want to invite you to join us right now, okay? As we sing to our God and we sing about our God. See, the scripture tells us in, in the book of Acts chapter 2 that when they were all together in one place, kind of like right now, and they were all together in one accord that the power of God showed up. Amen? So, this is what the title of this teaching is about. I, I called it the undiscovered power of gathering. There are so many of us that lose 
that power. We miss out on that power because we're not here in one accord. We're not all here for the same reason. The reason every one of us, from the youngest to the oldest, should be here today is to worship God. That should be our one and only, our one and only reason. Now, I understand there are many of us who are going through hard times. Maybe you're desperate in a desperate situation and it's difficult for you to see anything else because of the pain or because of the situation or because of the brokenness. I totally understand that. But here's what I want you to understand yourself. One more scripture. Psalm 22, verse 3. It says this, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. You need to understand something. God comes in to our praise. Some versions of the scripture says that he is enthroned on the praises of his people. If you need God, if you need a touch of God, if you need help from God, the quickest way to get God to your situation is to praise him. That's the quickest way. See, because he inhabits the praises of his people. That literally means that our praise becomes his throne. If you're sick, he's the healer. If you're desperate, he's our rescue. If you're broken, he's the mender of broken hearts. Don't you understand? Can't you see it yet? When you and I sing together at church, something is happening. We're all together. We're all saying the same thing. We finally come into one accord. Your need is different from mine. I may try with all my heart to relate to you, to show you compassion, to help. But I am so limited. Have you ever wanted to help someone and just couldn't? You and I were limited. But our God has no limits. He can heal your broken heart. I can't. He can meet your financial need. I can't. He can restore your trust when you were let down. I can't. And all it takes is for you to put your mind on one thing. I need you, Lord. I need you. Can you imagine when 1,600 people begin to say that one thing? We need you. We need you. Stand to your feet. Father God, we thank you for your word. Please help us be doers of it, not just hearers. Come, Lord God, and touch us. Whether we feel it or not, Lord, we desperately, absolutely need you. We're nothing without you, Lord God Almighty. We love you, Rob. We need you, Lord God Almighty. More than what we think sometimes. So we call on you. Jesus, 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 you ran someone like me. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.
For that reminder, Johnny, that uh, it's God who initiates worship by revealing himself to us. In a very real sense, we're in the same place. All of us are practicing lives of worship, and uh, our goal is Christ, and so there's always lots of room to grow, right? Even Paul said, uh, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And so all of us pressing on, striving, pursuing holiness, not for position, but from position because we're children and we want to live lives of worship. And the truth is we can't do any of it unless God reveals himself to us. So we, we call these celebration services, but the truth is we really come to be served in a way waiting on God to reveal himself so we can know him and worship him for who he is. So I pray today that each of you is, uh, is blessed with the revelation of God's love for you, with the revelation of his person, and that you can respond with love and respond with worship. Uh, 
want to uh, take a moment just to encourage you to pray for those who um, lost family members on September 11th um, and, and that you would be in prayer for those families, prayer for those who are friends of them as well and, and prayer for our nation in that. And then also I encourage you if you are a guest, if you would uh, grab those guest cards that we gave you and drop them off with the ushers um, on your way out or you can drop those off at the Lyft Cafe. I'm gonna invite our prayer team forward and I really want to encourage you as we're all uh, as we're all pursuing lives that worship God, lives that declare the worship of God, and as we're all pursuing um, a lifestyle that impacts the world around us, if you've got anything that you would like to partner with our prayer team with, that you would just come forward, partner with these men and women. They would love to pray with you. We'd love to be in prayer for you as well, and then uh, be in prayer for each other and be in prayer for, for us. And uh, this is a partnership. We're doing this together, right? This is our corporate expression as we sharpen each other, encourage each other, and build each other up. God bless you, Church on the Rock. Have a great day.